So, um, welcome to 214 on Tuesday, 2 o'clock, week 6, sequential circuit analysis. Now, um, how many of you came out of last week's lecture really confused and not because of the Zumba? <laughs> All right, more, more than you care to admit. Um, so, last week we talked about, we started talking about sequential circuits. And to open up the whole topic, we started talking about what, what those storage elements are. We showed different, kind of, um, different kinds of storage elements. And we slowly built it up, up until we got to the end of the lecture um, to a D flip flop. Now, in today's lecture and in next week's lecture, we will talk about uh, what do we do with these elements, what are sequential circuits. Uh, we'll analyze some sequential circuits that um, I'll present to you and then we'll go the other way and we'll actually design our own se sequential circuits um, and I'll lead you um, step by step through the way. Now, what I find uh, when we are usually teaching this material, students find it hard to um, understand the whole concept of what um, you'll see as state machines. So I do want to um, go fairly slowly um, through this uh, material. I will emphasize a few points and please take everything that I emphasize and when I tell you this is important, please take my word for it because it will be important um, and it will make, if you understand the important bits, then it will make your um, understanding of the whole topic um, a lot better. If you still find it confusing um, after today, le today's lecture, I do encourage you um, to, well, read through the lecture notes again, um, look through the book, there's um, a whole lot more explanation there, or even just come and ask me and I'm happy to go through um, some of the slides. So, to start off, by the way, I do have a new computer, I was announcing before it was coming, it finally came. Um, yesterday I had two hours fight with my computer trying to get it to work with this screen. Two hours later I m eventually managed to do so. Hopefully nothing will go wrong today. Um, so you've seen those structures before. Uh, the one at the top is the general structure of sequential circuits. Now when we presented that we said um, it's a fairly abstract uh, structure and in a second I will show you an actual circuit and we'll see how we relate this diagram here to the actual circuit. Before we get there, um, let's concentrate on the storage elements which is what we've done in last week's lecture. We derived ledgers and then we um, led up to flip-flops. We talked about the master-slave um, flip-flops and then eventually we got to the D flip-flop. We will use D flip-flops throughout the lecture today. Um, it's the most commonly used flip-flop um, out there right now. And we will treat it from now on as just a black box. We don't care for the purpose of this lecture what's going on inside. We only care about the behavior inside this element here. Now, just a bit of a recap, um, so everyone's up to speed with um, what this element does. This is an element that's driven by a clock, so a clock is a square wave. In this case here, it's a positive edge triggered D flip-flop. It means that whenever the clock goes, has a transition, a positive transition from zero to one, Whatever will be at the output D will be stored in this element here and will um, be output through the, um, the output Q. And we'll write it out. This is Q and not Q. Um, and this Q value will be held constant regardless of what's going on in the input until the next rise, rising edge of the clock here where a new input will be sampled and then propagated and held on Q. So essentially if we have a um, clock signal, Q can only change once per period, period and a period is this, a high followed by a low or if you want to be really ac um, accurate it could be a low followed by a high and um, it will only change in this case here only on rising edged, edges of the clock. Only at these times we actually look at what's at the input here and just let it propagate through um, to Q. 
any, any other time in between, D can change 0, 1, 0, 1. We don't care. We actually ignore it altogether until there's a rising edge. So uh, this is fairly simple way of understanding it. Um, what's going on inside is what we actually derived um, in last week's lecture. Uh, but from now on, we'll just take this behavior that I told you and we'll take it um, as granted. Now, to give you an example, yeah? Um, as in opposed to a falling edge? Yeah. All right. First of all, um, this um, uh, triangle here, and then some people actually ask me what does it mean. Um, this triangle here means it's an edge trigger, so it's only being um, sampled and updated on edges. When there's no bubble here, it means it's a positive edge, and most deep lift up will be positive edge. If you want to denote a negative edge, we'll just put a bubble at um, the entrance of the clock. Now this is just a, this is a standard symbol for a D flip flop. You will see this one everywhere, pretty much. Um, any other questions? All right, well let's jump right into it. And I'll give you an example of a sequential circuit. So in the circuit we have few elements. We have a couple of D, um, D flip flops um, here and here. These are our storage elements. Each one of them um, can hold one bit. So each one of them can store either a zero or a one. Um, together, both of them can have four different combinations of zeros and ones. Around, this, um, around these ele memory elements, we have the combination of logic, which is um, the regular and OR gates. And I will sort of mark everything that's combinational, all the combinational logic is in this um, yellow shape. Now, if we look back at the diagram here, we said into this combinational circuit, there are external inputs coming in, and there's also the present state or the current state, which are the outputs from the storage elements that are being fed back into the um, combinational circuit. And we can see it here. We have the input X, which is um, an external input coming into our combinational logic. And you can see the feedback paths. So for example, Q0 here sort of goes back and then feeds some of our um, combinational circuits. Um, Q1 and not Q1 also uh, feed back into our combinational circuits. And this is um, this sort of feedback loop there. Now, our combinational logic has two outputs from it. It either has the external outputs that we'll um, throw out to the real world. It also has something that's called the next state, something that will update our memory elements with the next state um, that we want. And again, you can see it here. The output, the external outputs, is just this uh, one output Y that goes out to the um, external world. And it, we also have um, these lines here that connected to the D flip flops that will drive the next state of the circuit. Now the idea is that uh, we have some present state in those two um, flip flops. It's hold some sort of a value. We will have a clocking signal that um, is just a square wave. Now whenever um, the clock has a rising edge, the flip flop will sample whatever the combinational circuit prepares for them as the next state, and we let that propagate through, and we hold that state for the entire duration of the clock period. In this time, whatever, uh, once we change those states, Q0 and Q1, new values, because we changed them, will propagate through the combinational logic. The input, the external input, might change as well at this time, and therefore, we will prepare a new state or new D inputs into our um, D flip flops. But these D inputs will not actually affect anything um, in the actual flip flop until there's another um, rising edge of the clock. So we're looking at the next rising edge of the clock. So this is pretty much the main idea behind sequential circuits, that you have a, pre a present state. In this case here, by the way, because there are two D flip flops, we can have one of four states, either 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1. 
where each one of those bits um, belong to one of those flip-flops. Usually um, Q0 will denote the least significant bit, Q1 will be um, in this case the more significant bit or in this case the most significant bit. And this, these are what we'll call our, um, our state. So we can have four possible states. Anytime we change a the state, there's some feedback loop that will prepare the next state that will come through on the rising edge of the clock. Now, a little bit, now a few words about notations because um, I use a certain notation. Um, if you read different books, they will use different notations. So I just want to emphasize this. Uh, the notation that I use is when we have a few uh, different flip-flops, the least significant one will be um, flip-flop zero and then we number it from there, zero, one, two, and so on. The current state will be um, denoted by a small cube. And we will, now that we'll go through the lecture, you'll see what I mean by current and next state. But the current state will be denoted by um, small q with the subscript of um, the number, so q0, q1. Next state by a large q. And then the, uh, the, the flip-flop inputs will be um, denoted depending on what type of flip-flop it is. For now, we know about um, d flip-flops. Next week, we will talk about jk flip-flops and t flip-flops, and then they will take um, the different notations. Um, but for now, we'll just use D. So D0, D1, and so on. Now looking back at our circuit, so how do we even analyze it? What does the circuit do? Um, how do we go about doing this? Well, let's try and see what the equations are at the entrance to our D flip-flops, or what will be the next state at every um, rising edge of the clock. I wonder if they fix the air conditioning. We're supposed to. Um, so we'll just follow the, line, the lines pretty much. If we, we start with x, and it's always a good idea to write um, sort of the signals throughout the lines because once we have very long lines, it will help us um, write whatever signals at the entrance to the gates. So x goes here and here and here, and the other places also here. This will be not x. Go propagate through to here. Um, Q1 will trace it back. So that's the current state Q1. We'll go here and we'll also go here. Not Q1 will trace it to here. Q0. Uh, just screwed something up. No. Q0 goes here and will branch to here and here, and I think these are all the inputs to the first level. Then we have the end gate, so we have x, q1, and this one will give us x, q0, which will result in x, q0, or x, q1. Um, from this end gate here, we'll have x, not q1, which will propagate through um, to this D input. Now, the, this one will give us Q0 or Q1. Ended up with um, this not X. We end up with not X, Q0 or Q1. So we essentially have three different equations, or three different expressions we can work with. The input to D1 is too much. Maybe the camera made it freeze. Uh, bad joke. The input to um, D1, I'm just rewriting what we um, have before just for um, convenience. The input to D0, where am I going to put it, is x not q1, and the output y is just this equation there. So now we know that depending on 
um, both the input and the current state, every rising edge of the clock, we will have something propagating through to those um, other two flip-flops, or to those two flip-flops, and the output will be also depending on the current input and the current state. Now, in this case here, when we talk about D flip-flops, we have what's called transition equations. We know from the structure of a D flip-flop that the output Q will just pretty much follow the input D every time there's a rising edge of the clock. Now, that sounds pretty trivial because, you know, the output just equals to the input. But it's not always going to be the case. Next week when we talk about JK flip-flops, we'll have something a little bit more complex. We'll have flip-flops that have um, two inputs, J and K, and the next state of each one of those flip-flops will be dependent um, on the current state and then some combination of the J and K. Um, don't let it worry you too much um, currently, but this is why I emphasize to realize that the next state will be equal just to the, um, to the D input, where it's not always going to be the case. So we have those equations that we came up with um, before. We know um, we derived the equations for the input of the D flip-flops, and therefore the next state, um, Q. We derived the equation to Y, and now we can come up with a state transition table. Now, um, please know the terminology because these um, terminologies will come again and again. State transition tables, sometimes also known as a state table without the transition. This table will list all the possible states that we can have in the circuit. And then depending on uh, whatever the inputs are, it will tell us what the next state from each one of those states are. And this is dependent on the equations. To fill this thing in, we will write out all the possible states that we can have in our circuit. And we said two uh, flip-flops will have at most four different states. Now, to derive the next state, we will just follow the equations. And we split it into the two cases where the input is 0 or when the input is 1. So for example, if the input is 0, and um, we're in state 0, 0, so small q's um, are 0 and 0, we can set them in the equations and come up with q1 will be something ended with x and another thing ended with x. Now because x is 0, um, these two, right? Yeah. Yeah? These two uh, will just be 0. In the case of um, q0, which is equal to d0, um, in all the cases that the input is zero, this will be zeroed out as well. So just following the equations, we will um, just fill it up with zeros because in all cases when x is zero, all these terms will be zeroed out. It's a bit of a quick way to do it. Um, it's a little bit different when we look at um, x equals 1. So if the input is 1, we'll follow these equations. Um, D1 just becomes Q1 or, no, or um, Q0. So it's that or that. So we will have 0 and then uh, 1, 1, and 1, 1 or the other. Q0, when x is 1, just follows not Q1, um, just the current state of not Q1. So if we look at Q1, not Q1 will be 1, 1, and then 0, 0. It's just the inverse of this thing here. So reading um, this state table now here will tell us if we're in state 0 and the input is 1, the next state will also stay at 0. If the input was 1, we will go to state 1. If we're in state 1, the input is 0. We'll, we'll go back to state 0. If the input is 1, we will go to state 3, or 1, 1. So there's a bit of a play with um, the state transitions. What about the outputs? Well, we have an equation for the output as well. 
the output will be dependent on the current input and the current state. And just following the equations, we'll see that, well, let's start with x equals 1 because this will zero up the whole um, expression and we'll know that the outputs when x equals 1 are just zeros. When x equals 0, um, the output will just be q1 or q0, which will be 0, 1, 1, 1. So this is a complete state table. And from this, we can actually um, derive a whole lot of information about our, um, about our circuit or about our machine. We know the behavior from every state. Um, depending on the input, what will be the next state? And then we also know what um, the output is going to be. Another way to represent state machines or um, sequential um, circuits is through a state diagram. A state diagram will take the exact same information that has um, in the state um, table and we'll um, draw it graphically using um, state balloons and arrows. So we'll start off with writing all the possible states. Where each one of those states has its own um, circle. Now we will use arrows to denote transitions between um, each state to the next state. And we'll read this information from the state table. So if we're in current state 0, 0, so we're here, we know that we will either go back to state 0, 0 if the input is 0. So we'll use an arrow that goes back to itself, and it will be on input 0. Or I'll go to state 1 when the input is 1. So I will use another arrow that will tell me if the input is 1, I will go to that state. Now what about the outputs? I can write the outputs on these arrows as well because those outputs are dependent on the transition whether the input was 0 or 1. I will use the notation of the input as we have it there slash the output. So if I'm in state 0 and the input is 1, I will throw 0. Um, as an output. If I'm in state 0 and the input is 1, I will throw 0 as well. So in both cases the output will be 0, but the transitions will on 0 I'll stay in the same state. On 1 I will move on to state 0, 1. Filling up the rest of the state diagrams using the same logic. If I'm in 0, 1, I will go either back to 0, 0 on input 0, and I will throw out 1 as an output, or I will go to state 1, 1 and throw out a 0. Everyone's happy with the notation? No? Yeah. So from 1, 0 going to this state on 0, throwing 1, and then going back to itself on 1, throwing 0. From 1, 1, going back to 0 on input 0, throwing output 1, or going to state 1, 0 on input 1, throwing out a 0 at the output. Clear? Sorry. Yeah? I mean, you know this little bubble, you know inside the circle says got 0, 0, 0, 1. What are those? Are those the input, the current states, or what are they? These are the current states. Oh, okay. So each bubble, so the notation here is that each one of those circles denotes a state. If we had, for example, three flip flops in the, cir in the circuit, then uh, this will give us eight different states, and they will have eight different circles. Um, and then the arrows denote the transitions between the different um, circles. Now with a state machine, notice that each one of those states must have as many outgoing arrows as input combinations. 
In this case here, we only had one input combination, so, sorry, two input combinations, either a zero or a one, which means each one of them will have two arrows um, leaving the state. If we had, for example, two inputs to our circuit, we'll have four different input combinations, and then each state will have four different um, arrows leaving that state. Um, we must account for all possible input combinations. You can't have um, a state that doesn't have as many outgoing arrows as input combinations because then what happens if you are in the state and then comes in this particular input combination and you don't know where to go from there. The circuit will do something so you have to account for this when you actually draw the state um, diagram. Now one last remark that I want to make on this thing this notation here is what we call a milling machine. Um, we will talk more about milli and more machines on Friday. Um, but the idea with milling machine is that the output changes on the transition of the state. So you do put the outputs when you have transitions um, between one state and another and this is when the output is valid and this is when you read it. Uh, we will talk about more machines um, on Friday where I think we'll talk about it on Friday, yep, where the outputs will be um, depending only on the state and then we don't actually write it in the transitions. Don't worry about it for now, we will see it later. Any questions so far? All right. Now let's go the other way. So up until now, I've shown you the circuit. I said, all right, it's got a couple of flip-flops. It's got some um, combinational logic. Um, this is the state, um, the state diagram. This is the state table. This is um, enough information to tell us what the circuit does. Now, if we want to go the other way and say, let me throw a problem at you, some requirement, that requires a um, sequential circuit, how do you go about coming up with a sequential circuit that does follow the requirement, um, that has the memory elements and they're all connected together? Well, as it says here, usually we'll start off with some high level specification, just like the combinational um, design that we've done. It will be some English problem. It'll tell you, um, hey, you gotta do a machine that does X and Y and go and do it. Sometimes um, not the whole thing will be fully specified. Sometimes you will have to make some assumptions. Now those specifications may or may not define what the inputs or the outputs of the circuit are. Sometimes you as a designer need to come up with what's sensible to be inputs and outputs. And then we end up with some circuit that has memory elements in it that obviously we verified and we're sure that it's working and we can go to our boss and say, hey, we've done what you wanted. Now, let's see how um, we go about doing this. Here's an example. And this is a 1101 sequence recognizer. So the problem is design a circuit that uh, recognize the sequence 1101. It tells you the circuit has only one input, so it's not a four input parallel, um, parallel input. You have one serial input coming in, so a single bit is read every clock cycle. You have to design a machine that will um, have one output Z. There will be asserted one every time we recognize this pattern um, on the incoming serial line and will stay zero otherwise. And it tells you that that Z goes to one when we detect the last one of um, the sequence. Now have a bit of a think, how do we even go about doing this? How many memory elements do we need? Four memory elements. Two or four? Well, I need four bits. We need four bits, but two memory elements. You meant four combinations once you have two elements. Yeah. So, so which, which four combinations are we looking at, though? I just need to be able to go around the circle and print one. Sorry? So I'm thinking yeah. about this. 
All right. Uh, but you say two memory elements yeah. for four combinations, but you're not quite sure what the combinations are. Right. Right. I mean, why we, one way of doing this is to remember um, always the four less bits that we read. So that will require four memory elements. How do you know? Maybe. OK. Well, that's you know what I said. Remember um, all the time the four less inputs that came in. That's one way of doing this. There may be a better way. Um, the conclusion, by the way, there's more than one way to solve um, any sequential circuit problem. In fact, there's infinitely many ways you can resolve it. Usually, we will try to get um, to the optimum or the near optimum solution the best we can. We'll probably never be able to actually um, come to an optimum solution for a problem unless we try all the infinitely many different um, combinations, which means never. But we will try our best. Now, we, because it's going to be a sequential circuit, we do need um, to use states. And we'll start by defining states. Now, we said we might have two memory elements which will give us four different states, which implies two bits. Uh, but we're not sure yet because we haven't attempted the problem just yet. I claim, well, we can do it with um, four memory elements, which require four bits. <coughs> All right. Um, well, I want to start with the point that um, we don't know at the beginning how many uh, memory elements we're going to need. And this is, you know, this is a relatively simple question. You can sort of think ahead. Um, but when you come to more complex questions, we don't know how many memory elements we will need. And therefore, we can just give um, to pre-allocate the binary combinations for the different states, because we don't know how many states we're going to have. And this is why we will use just some generic names. Um, we'll start with calling the states A, B, C, D, E, and then go along as many as we need. Later, when we figure out um, how many states we ended up with, this is when we'll go back to convert it into binary combinations and then implement it in the circuit. Now, one thing that I want to emphasize, and this is the part where I cannot emphasize enough. When we come up with states, always, 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 and again, always write an English, descri an English description for what each one of those states does. Don't start coming up with states and, and don't remember what they mean, because each one of those states in your circuit needs to have a meaning, meaning that you can go back and say, ah, if my circuit is in this particular state, that's because something happened, and this is the description for this um, state. I will, now that I um, derive the circuit, I will write the English description for each one of the states that I define. Students tend to have a tendency to uh, make shortcuts and say, oh yeah, I'll know what the states are, um, and then they get lost. So. I cannot emphasize it enough, and I will do it again. Please, please um, write the English description. If you don't, it either implies you're lazy, in which case you shouldn't be here. You're probably not here if you're lazy. Or it means that you don't actually understand what those states do. You, a lot of times, um, I see people defining states, and they're like, oh yeah, that's probably something like this. But it's not very well defined. And when you have something that's probably like this, it's probably wrong as well. So make sure you understand why you define certain states. Right, the English description. I think I said enough about this. Now let, let's attack the problem. Let's see how we go about doing this. Remember, we wanted to detect the sequence 1101. Now, where do we start? We want to um, implement, and I will start implementing a state diagram that will graphically um, show me in a bit of a higher level what the different states will be in my circuit. But when I start, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what states I will need. So I will start with some state. I'll call it A. And I will define A as 
circuit in it. So the initial state of the circuit, we will go into this state. I don't know what happened yet. We've seen nothing useful. In fact, we haven't seen anything at all because we just started up the circuit. Now, in order to uh, recognize this um, pattern here, the method I will follow in deriving the different states, I will say, well, every time I will detect something that will um, get me closer to recognizing the, that particular pattern, I will transition to another state. Then, um, this is the method I will go about doing this, once I derive all the states that lead me to recognize this pattern, I will then talk about um, patterns that are different from this one and what different states do we need um, to go to them. So we've seen nothing yet. We're now waiting on the input X to come in. And let's say this input X came in and it was a 1. If it's a 1, then I will define state B as well. We've seen a 1 at the input. Maybe it's the 1 that start off the sequence that we want. We know if it was a 0, then we're not getting any closer to the sequence. If it's a 1, great. Now we said um, for every transition we say what the output is as well. Well, the output only goes one when we finally recognize the sequence. Obviously, we haven't seen the sequence yet. We may be getting closer to it. So the output will stay zero still because we haven't recognized this, um, the sequence. Now, if we're in state B, so we've seen a one, and to get closer to that uh, pattern, we want to see another one. So we will open another state C and we'll transition to this state when we've seen another one. So if we're in state B, meaning we've seen a one, and then we go to state C, then state C says, well, we've seen a one, one. Because we've seen the one from state B, then we've seen another one. This is how we ended up in state C. Maybe it's those two ones here. Uh, that begin our pattern. Same logic um, follows. Now we want to see a zero to get closer to our pattern. So we will transition. Oh, by the way, there was the output of zero because we haven't recognized um, a sequence yet. Back to um, transitioning from C. We will get closer to our pattern if we see a zero. So that means D stands for seen a 1, 1, 0. That maybe it will be the 1, 1, 0 starting off our pattern. But we haven't seen the pattern yet, so we will um, still speed out a 0. Now, the best thing that can happen to us right now is if we see another one because then we recognize the sequence and then we can say all right great we will output a one recognize the sequence awesome where do we transition next from here though because to the start to a yeah because we haven't seen anything useful yet or have we well, we have, but we've been for the, we've outputted our one already, so we go back to and wait for another one. Yeah, but maybe this one here that came is the beginning of another one one zero one. So we go back to B, because this one here may be the beginning of another one, and B tells us that we've seen a one that may be useful um, as the beginning of one one zero one. So from here, we don't need to open a new state because now we're on the lookout for um, the pattern again. We have seen um, that one that might start off um, another sequence. 
and we'll transition there when we see a 1. Obviously, we'll output a 1 as well, because we've finally seen the sequence. So that's just if everything goes well. What if things don't quite go well? What if, we, if we're in state A, so we boot up the circuit, we haven't seen anything, and we get a 0? Where do we go there? We go back to A because we still see nothing useful. So we'll go to A on 0, and OVC will output a 0. And this is, by the way, when um, descriptions, even these descriptions, start being very useful. Because now I can say, I'm in state B, I've seen a 1. What happens if I see now a 0? I know what happens if I see another 1. If I see a 0, we're going back to A because there's nothing useful about this 0. Kind of screwed us up. Now if we're in C, we know what to do when we see a 0. What if we see a 1? Go back to B. Yep. Go back to B. Yep. Go back to B because it could be that one, the beginning of another sequence, output a zero because we haven't seen anything useful. Actually, no, you're right. And this is where I didn't read the English description. If I was in C, and I see another one, that is actually still keeps us close to um, the pattern. Because C tells us we have seen a one. There comes another one. It may be that um, those two ones that will start our sequence. Um, whomever shouted out, thank you. Um, again, I did not read the description. And this is what happens. So on one, we'll um, stay in C. But it's not quite a pattern, so we will output a zero. Last thing to look at is what happens with state D if we, um, if we see a zero. Go back to A. Because, yeah, nothing's too useful. We'll go back to A on input zero and We'll have output zero. Now, I think we're done. You think so too? The, the way to check, by the way, if you fully specified your machine is to check that we have accounted for all the possible input combinations for all the, from all the different states. So A has something that will happen on zero and one. B will have something happening on 0 and a 1, C on 0 and 1, D on 0 and 1. We can now fully specify our machine. So this is a graphical way of representing it. Now how do we get a step closer into actually implementing this thing? Well, a few things. First of all, to implement it, we do need to now assign um, some binary combinations to these things because circuits can't, no, can't work with states A, B, C, and D. They do need some sort of um, binary combination. But before we do that, it's actually more useful um, to work with a state table rather than with the graphical design. So I will fill up this um, state transition table still with the English alphabet states that we um, defined. So we know from what we've done, A on 0 will go to A, output a 0. On 1, we'll go to B and output a 0 as well. B will go to C on 1 and we'll go back to A on 0, where in both cases it will output um, 0 and 0 because we haven't seen our pen just yet. C will go to D on 0 and will go back to itself on 1, still outputting 0 and 0, where the last case D will either go sorry, to A on 0 or to B on 1, 
But this case, if it goes to A, it will output a zero. If it goes to B, it means that we've seen our um, pattern just there. All right. Let's take 10, 15 minutes break and we'll continue after that.